Hello, and welcome to the Wade Borth Podcast. I'm your host, Wade Borth. And in every episode, my goal is to get you to think differently about how money works and ultimately to empower you to take control of your money and your personal financing system. Hello, and welcome back to the Wade Borth Podcast. Today, I have a special guest, like all my guests are, they're special, they're fabulous people. I actually had the opportunity to meet a gentleman by the name of Luke Tatum at the IBC Think Tank that we both attended recently, and Luke is an IBC practitioner, and we had an opportunity to sit at a table and discuss uh, for about an hour, hour and a half, just what's important to us and why we're here, and I found him very fascinating. And at the end of that conversation, he springs this thing that, hey, I got a book. And I'm like, let me read it. I'm so excited to read it. So I got his book. I had a chance to go through it. And the book is called Between the Lies. And we'll talk about that today. But it was just, it is so in line with what we teach and what we believe. And the fact that he was a think tank, he's an IBC practitioner. I thought, man, I love the story that I tell. I'm passionate about the story I tell. But I want people to hear how other people are telling basically the same story. So it's not just me saying it. It's contrary to what a lot of people out there might believe. There's a lot of people telling the story. There's a lot of people absorbing and being part of the story. And so if you think you're alone, I'm going to tell you you're not because there is a whole community of people out there trying to take control of the banking function in their lives. And Luke does a great job of trying to get the message out. He's got a great book. It's well-sourced. It gives. It goes back to Nelson. It gives him credit for becoming your own banker. So I really appreciated uh, Luke's time and energy he put into his book. Again, just the sourcing and just the how he refers back to Nelson. And Nelson was obviously the thought leader in this idea. So again, welcome, Luke. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me, Wade. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, it was fun. I, I had a great time at the Think Tank. It was a great opportunity to meet, to be around like-minded people and to reinforce our thoughts that we have, to challenge our thoughts and make sure that we're on track and saying the right things. But again, just more importantly, just be able to meet people like you. That's one of the things that I enjoy about Think Tank is there's so many people there that are saying the same thing. We're all pulling the same direction. So let's get to know each other. So it was fun uh, sitting at the table with you. I even kept my uh, little sheet that you that we had to go through asking the questions about uh, about the different things about you so we could find out more about you. It was fun. It was a good time. Yeah, I definitely had a good time. I'm glad that we had a chance to run into each other. And I think you and I both had similar feelings when it comes to like the value of some of the discussion there. It's we really got a chance to collaborate. And this conversation we're having right now is because we got a chance to meet and interact and get to know each other a little bit. And and there's a big old world out there and we ought to work together. Like you said in your intro to get the word out. So very thankful for that. Yeah. There's, uh, there's so many people that are in, that are distressed about, about their finances, distressed about, that, that carry stress, maybe not even distress, but carry stress because they're not in control of that banking function in their lives. And that's probably the biggest message I want to get out to people. It's like, I talked to one gentleman, he's very successful in this, and he was a doctor, is a doctor, and his point is most people die from, from cardiovascular disease. And the biggest contributor to cardiovascular disease, both men and women, is stress. And what do people right. stress most? They stress most about money, finances. But what are we doing differently. If everybody's having that issue, then what are we doing differently? So what's your take when you hear me talking about that stress and how we can help people relieve that stress that they have? Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's taking a step back and questioning some of the fundamentals because I think that we're all brought up in an environment where we take a whole lot of things for granted in the world. And one of those things is access to capital or money, access to money when you need it. And for most people, that means a credit score, and it means playing the the game of the banking world, right? But it's easy to, I don't know, run afoul of that system, right? It, your, the timing in your life doesn't line up with the timing in the business cycle and the banking world and all that. I mean, it's something I harp on in my book is that what if you're a real estate investor or something like that, and then there's a housing market collapse and the bank calls your note? If you're doing all your business through banks, you're not in a very good spot at that point in time. Nelson Nash, of course, knows that lesson too, right? Or that's something he's spoken about. And so it's just a thing that it's just taking a step back and it's saying, okay, I need to control the mechanics here and remove as many other people out of this picture as possible so that I don't get caught flat-footed <laughs> from forces beyond my control. 
Yep, exactly. And this this leads back to uh, the story that Nelson told in his book, right, where he ended up really with about seven hundred fifty thousand dollars of debt in 1981 right. through some real estate ventures. And again, this is what the quote unquote professionals, the experts, were telling him to do is to leverage buy real estate, and he did exactly what they did, what, he, what they told him to do, and then the interest rates go up to 21%. Now, if you think about that, in 1981, he had $750,000. Now, I know some people right now with $750,000. That's the price of my house. It's not that big a deal. But right. if we put it in today's terms, right, if we adjust for inflation, what's that in today's dollars? That's somewhere in the neighborhood of about three to three and a half million dollars of debt at 20% interest. Now, I'm no genius, but 20% interest on $3 million is like $600,000 just in interest cost alone. Yeah. So think about how much stress he was under because he yeah. didn't control the banking function. And uh, this is where it becomes self-evident where how this idea took place is like, why don't I control that function? I mean, it's such a simple thought. It's just crazy. It's a simple thought, right? Why sh I should control the banking function, but nobody has given it more than about 10 seconds or they've never even thought about it. They just said, well, that's right. the way it is. We condition to think that way because banks and you turn on the TV and there's 10 channels all devoted to either banking or Wall Street. And it's just this constant bombardment of noise. And he was out there and he experienced that. And he was like, if you don't control the banking function, you don't control your life and you don't control your business. Now, I think that was the end of the story. It would be the be the uh, moral of that story. And I'll just add a little note because this is making me recall a, a recent conversation. A few weeks ago, a client of mine sent me, and then I started seeing the same thing out there, sent me a photo of these ads that people are running on social media. So like Quicken Loans and places like that are running these ads, and the ads are saying basically, they're saying, hey, why don't you bank on yourself? And it's like, wait, right? why is Quicken Loans talking about this? What they're talking about is a HELOC. It's like, use your right. house. And yep. they're advertising this one. I don't remember all the numbers. It's been several weeks, I can say. But it's like $575 in payments over a certain period of time. It's like what they're actually doing, if you go use a HELOC calculator and figure out what they're doing, they're talking about interest only for 10 years. And then your payment will skyrocket after that. And so it's like, okay, I don't know. I don't know if that's really banking on yourself exactly it's interesting i actually i wrote a blog on just that alone i saw that ad pop up my feed i'm like yeah what are they talking about i dug into it and i exactly the same conclusion is like holy smokes they're trying to get people they're trying to get people away from the from somebody else's bank and put them in their bank and one right. of the things that i think is so valuable about what you and i and just for the listeners that are on here luke is an ibc practitioner and he does the same thing i do and so i don't see luke as my competition i see luke as my partner in this venture right and so what we do in, isn't taking control of the of your banking function. I don't want to take control of my client's banking function. I want to empower them to take control of their banking function. I don't want to be the gatekeeper. I want to educate and I want to empower. Quicken Loans, all they're trying to do is replace Wells Fargo with Quicken Loans. That's all they're trying right. to do, right? Right. And which is so different than what we do, which is empower people. To, it, Nelson wrote the book, Becoming, right? The first word is becoming your own banker. You have to become somebody that you're not right now. Right. And I think there's a real strength and a real thought-provoking part of that book is becoming your own banker. And not saying Wade should be your banker, Luke should be your banker. It's you need to become your own. Right. It's seeing yourself as that other version, right? It's seeing yourself as a banker and then getting there. That's a very important distinction. I'm glad you're saying this. <laughs> yep. Very much so. It's just another business. And it took, this what took me a while. And I got into this doing the math. I used to say 15 years ago, but now it's 17 years ago because I was there at the beginning when we first started doing think tanks. It is, Nelson always said, you're in two businesses, right? For a while, I'm like, I don't get what he's saying there. It's, now I look at it, it's so simple, right? So once we've gone through that door, that doorway into this room, we look back and I'm like, well, that was a simple move. But at the time, it was a difficult move to make, right? But he always said, you're yeah. in two businesses, right? You're in the business of doing what you do, but you're also in the business of banking. And it's not commercial banking. It is the process of how we think and use money. That's what banking is. And being respectful to our dollars and loving ourselves more than we love Wells Fargo. Loving ourselves and our family more than we love Chase or Bank of America. Because we always, we're always willing to play by their terms. So why aren't our terms at least as good or better than what they offer? Right, right. It's just, oh. it's, a total, it's a total mind shift. And just as you said, it's something that, like I was a real slow seller. I always like to say I'm a slow seller. Like I don't buy into new ideas very quickly. I spend my time and I think through and I research and, okay, give me another book to read, that kind of thing. And But, man, when IBC all clicked in my head, 
I was like, wow, this is changing my life right now. <laughs> it's real fun when other people have that moment too. You get to, I mean, you and I both, right? You get to be there for that sometimes. It's like, wait, I get it. Yeah, exactly. I love, I love that, that moment because it's the end of their old thought process and it's the start of this big wide world that they haven't even imagined. And that's the exciting part, right? They're going to go on this adventure and you're there to help guide them along the way. Again, I don't want to lead them. I don't want to be that gatekeeper, but I'm going to help guide them. I'm going to say, here's some potholes I ran into, may or may not be what you run into, and just give them some of that guidance. And once they've been in that world for a little bit and they start experiencing some things, then they take off. And to the point where I hope at the end of the day, my clients are 10 times the businessmen and women and or 10 times the bankers, personal bankers than I am, because that's my ultimate goal is get them to be way better than I've ever been. So yeah, absolutely. And part of that is it's education and reading. And so I want to touch on your book, Between the Lies. And I, when we first taught him, like, Between the Lies, what are you talking about? But you title it Between the Lies, and you go into, you expand on some of the thoughts that Nelson's had, Nelson had in his book, but you also have some of your other thoughts that obviously Nelson didn't touch on because it was written in the early 2000s. And we've had a lot of things transpire between now and then. So let's start with, what you come up with the title? How did you become, uh, come with the title Between the Lies? I got to tell you, I, I agonized over a title for this book forever. So it had multiple previous titles, and I just could not come up with a good name. I would get something I thought was okay, and then I would, I had that on my documents for a while, and then I would change it, and then I would change it again. And anyway, the eventual settlement here, it just came to me. I was driving out to an event out in Oklahoma, and I was like, wait, I got it. And the kind of vision for the cover and the title of the book all came to me all at once and so i see the lies and the way that the book is laid out if you look at it visually it's two lines it's a dollar sign and there's the two lines of the dollar sign right and i feel like people are between the left and the right lines the two lines are the kind of banking establishment and then the investment establishment Right. Mm. And so you, you kind of have this you stay in your lane kind of thing. It's, they're not saying that. They're not saying, oh, don't try to do anything on your own necessarily. They're just telling you this is how you do things. They're giving you a guideline. They're giving you a lane to stay in, whether you realize mm -hmm. it or not. They're gatekeepers, totally gatekeepers. And they're very good at it, right? Because they're not saying we control your destiny. Do this. They're just saying you want to go buy a car. Okay, this is how you buy a car. Right. And they just guide you into this little uh, niche that they'd like you to be in. And if you don't ever figure anything else out, then they're perfectly happy. So that's a concept there. And the beginning of the book, I'm very critical of a lot of things in the book, but the beginning especially, I'm, I'm nailing down, like this is some legitimate, demonstrable problems that are, exist with these two spheres of the financial world. And you need to know these things because people are going to take advantage of you if you don't figure them out. So that's really the intent. And if people stop there, at least they've picked up a couple of like lessons that'll <laughs> carry them for the rest of their lives. You can say, wait a minute, I realize that I'm being taken advantage of right now. You know, that was one thing that Nelson, he said a number of times in his book too, right? He says, if you understand just maybe even 10%, maybe 10% of his book or 10% of your book, realistically, that's almost enough to win by default because people, the vast majority of people are what I would say drifting through life, right? They don't even give it 10 cents worth of thought. And this is like the most valuable part of their life is the banking function or their money, right? They're trading, think about this, they're trading the most valuable asset they have in their life, which is time. If we only have a finite amount of time in this world for something that's for money, right? And we can make as much money as we want. We don't have to trade our time for that, but that's what they're willing to trade. This most valuable asset for this thing called money and they don't give it they don't give it the respect that it's due quite frankly they just don't give it much thought at all right when i say they don't give it thought they worry about it but they don't give much thought of how they can improve the situation how they improve and nelson talked about improve the environment you're in that's really what we talked about so right right it's the same with a lot of things i mean so many things something i talk about a lot not in the book necessarily but just in in conversation is that you start to realize at a certain point that it's not really so much like different topics that you need to learn about. It's not, oh, I need to focus on economics now. Oh, I need to learn about history now. Oh, I need to learn about any philosophy now. It's more like these things start to bleed into each other, and your study in economics affects your study in philosophy, <laughs> you know, and, and those sorts of things. And so once you start to sort of see 
what's going on, once you start to see what you haven't been taught, then I just feel like everything is sort of the same subject. And I don't know, maybe that resonates with you, maybe it doesn't. But <laughs> it's like, it, I just feel like whenever I improve my knowledge in one area now, it helps me crystallize my understanding in everything else. And it gives me a pretty firm foundation whenever I'm having these conversations, I feel like. Yeah, I, I would agree with you. I think it's not, everything's not compartmentalizable, right? Yeah. You have to, they all have a bleed over effect. And we, at in our agency, in our group, we talk about this idea of five circles and we want abundance in all five circles. And when you grow abundance in your finances, you grow abundance in your business, you grow abundance in your spiritual life, whatever it is, your family life, that abundance, if you imagine the circle growing, will make every other circle grow as well. Because you're happier, you're more successful, and also now it leads into all these other things. So if you think about it from that standpoint, you have these five circles. Just because you're super successful in one, again, we want to have balance, but by having success in one, will create success in all of the four, four other areas as well. So I'm right in line with you there as well. So we just say it a little differently, right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I'm still that's refining what, how I say these things too, of course. <laughs> and that's what's so fun about going to this think tank and going to a group of IBC practitioners is that we're all basically saying the same thing. And we have our own little spin on it. It's not a complete deviation. It's just a different way of how we get it across because it's us, right? We There was 250 people there and there's 250 individuals and 250 individual stories and how IBC affected them, right? So we all either say something that's right in line, but it's said differently or it's said differently because it's impacted each person differently. And I think that's the important part is that I've heard people say, well, this is so great. Why isn't everybody doing it? I'm like, there is a lot of people doing it, but they call it different things, right? And they don't necessarily have a word to be able to put it together, but there's a ton of people doing it. And so, and I would say, even if there wasn't a ton of people doing it, there's a lot of money that goes towards this process. So you take the look, I use the, I said, what does $20 billion and $24 billion mean to you, Luke? Right? That's the amount of money that Wells Fargo keeps in properly structured life insurance. And that's what the $24 billion is what Bank of America keeps in properly structured life insurance. So think about that from that standpoint is like, there's a lot of people doing this. So don't feel, don't ever feel alone. And one thing in your book, you talk about uh, you know, the bank is not your friend. I want you to maybe expand on that a little bit. I use that all the time. I said the bank and the government and the IRS are not your friend, but go ahead and maybe give me your take on that. Sure. Yeah, sure. And so going back to uh, the concept for the title and all that, right? Like it's the bank is not your friend. Wall Street is not your friend. Those are two different chapter titles. And yeah. that's it's, it's key to kind of know that. But there's a lot of meat on that, on those bones, so to speak. There's a whole lot mm -hmm. there. There's a whole lot of reasons that you can say the bank is not your friend. And it, it's all smiles when you go into a bank, right? It's all, oh, we're so happy that you're here. We're your local community bank. We're here to support you and help you. And it's not that, like, the person at the desk talking to you in the bank is, like, a bad actor. I mean, if people who are in banking in your community, it's not like they're bad people. But the banking system is harmful to you, right? And so it's not that the banker, you know, I'm not, I'm not encouraging you to, like, break off your friendship with the banker that you know. <laughs> but it's the banking system, the way that it's designed, your money, like you're, you're talking about respecting the dollars that you earn, respecting the money that, that you're accumulating and those sorts of things. And it is not respect by a bank, right? When you put a money in the bank, they are utilizing that to create more money out of literally nothing. <laughs> and they're loaning that to somebody else. And they're charging interest on the money that they just literally made up. And it's just, it's this kind of like nonstop cash grab where they're just, you know, the more that they do that, the more they're able to do it again. And so it's, that is inflation, right? We don't have to get into the weeds on that because obviously that's a big topic, but creating new money makes your money worth less. And so like, then you have Wall Street come in and I know I'm jumping topics, but then you have Wall Street come in and say, well, hey, you know, inflation is a thing and you need to worry about inflation. You've got to invest your money so you can beat inflation. Otherwise, you're just going to be losing. Right. And so they're ready for that. They're ready for the handoff. It's like a total <laughs> it's a total play that's all structured and ready to go. And so, oh, cool. We've got these beautiful things called mutual funds and et cetera. Like we all know this story because we've all been told it. But that's kind of the idea. It's like th this is a pre-designed 
and they're just ready with open arms for you to show up and say, oh, I need a place to deposit my paycheck, and I need a place to save for my kid's education, and I need a place for et cetera, et cetera. And, and they so, don't even never want you to save for your kid's education. They want you to finance your kid's education, right? right. You finance it either way, but the one way is still more insidious than the other. I think about the visual in your book, and this is great because, again, you have the two lines going down through the dollar sign, and you have Wall Street on one side, the bank on the other side of these lines. And I see the consumer, the individual, the person out there that that's feeling a little bit hopeless, they're getting it's I look at it, it's almost like a, a ping pong table, right? So you got you got the investment side ready there to whack you on one side and they hit you over the bank and they whack you on the other side and send you back over the investment side and they whack you. And it's just a constant back and forth and you don't think there's any way to get out. And we're just I guess the point we're here to tell is there is a way to get out. Get yeah. out of that back and forth and stop being whacked by both sides and again take control of that function in your life so so you don't have to be whacked on both sides. Right, right. I mean, we just, like, it, it is a totally different life. And it's not something that I really had a clear understanding of until we started to, like, fully embrace the idea that, like, I, I, I have responsibility for my financial life. <laughs> when you finally kind of lock that down and say, actually, no, I'm not going to go to the bank for a loan. It, it really changes how you live day to day. And I mean, it's for the better. I'm just here to say that. <laughs> And so it actually leads me to a question. I think about clients, people I've talked to, maybe not clients understand this, but I get some people that are afraid to take control. They're afraid to be empowered, to be in control because then they're ultimately responsible. Right. And I'm like, why don't more people embrace this idea? And I think it's, I think that's part of it too, is that they look at it and they go, if I do that and it doesn't go right, then I'm responsible. Well, I'm here to tell you that you're responsible for not taking action as well. Right. Right. You, no. you, you, you don't get to result. choose not to pay a price, right? You get to choose which price you want to pay, <laughs> but you don't get right. to choose no price. Yeah, that's exactly right. You you don't get to choose not to pay the price. So the question is, do you want to take, pay the price of putting some time and effort into to understanding what's going on, engaging with somebody that's been there, done that, can guide you through? Again, I don't want to lead you. I want to guide you through right. uh, the pitfalls and the perils. And not that there's a lot. The pitfalls and the perils are the ones that we throw out in front of us or the outside noise throws in front of us. This process is, again, we don't have to recreate the process. It's already there. So we just have to understand it and embrace it. And that's the beauty of it. And to your point, once you've entered through that door and now the light comes on in the room, you can't imagine why you didn't do it 20 years beforehand. Right, right. And I think that's what I hear probably more times. I wish I'd have done this earlier. And it's that regret. And there's a book called The Power of Regret by Daniel Pink. I don't know if you've read that one or not. I haven't read it. No. Uh -uh. But he makes the point. He says, those things that you regret are those things that you find immense value in. Otherwise, you wouldn't regret it. He talks about there's a number of different types of regrets. You can go back and read it. But it's a really good book talking about. I think it's a little long winded, but I think it's a good book because it talks about if we regret doing something or not doing something, it's because. It was that was something that was valuable to us, and so a lot of people regret. Like, all right, we, the biggest regret, by the way, is money. We should have saved more. I should have done better with my finances, so on and so forth. But again, a roadmap hasn't been laid out. We have we don't have a clear picture. We're stumbling through the dark, as it were. And until somebody says, "Hey, I'm going to stop. I'm going to educate myself. I'm going to turn on the light switch because I know it's right here in my right by my right hand." You're going to stumble through the dark the rest of your life. And then when you get to the end, you're going to regret that you didn't do this sooner. And then I've heard people say, oh, I'm too old for this. Are you really? Do you have other generations? I mean, think of, and that's one of my, what's one of my founding values is that I waited until I was 35 years old before I really got this and I understood this. Or, and I don't say understood, before I was willing to listen. But Nelson always told me, he says, I always thanked him for being my mentor and helping me out with this process. And he says, all I did was cast seed on fertile soil. And he says, you took the ability to, you took the time and the effort to go water. Yeah. And so I, I get that to people. It's like, this is something that we can cast all the seed on, on all the soil we want. But until you take the time to educate yourself and make a purpose of why you want to do it, it's not going to happen. And, and I think you lay that out kind of in your book as well. Here's the reasons why. So. Thank you. Yeah. I, I mean, that there, spoiler alert, I guess, on the book, but, you know, the back half, the back part of it lays out some steps that you should take. One of those steps is to this idea and to take control of your finances. But the first step is to take responsibility because that is 
the thing. Oh. If you, the other steps are not open to you unless you are willing to bear this responsibility, right? You can't, you I mean, <laughs> it, it's so fundamental, right? Everything starts in your brain. The book, that's why the book starts talking about your brain, how you think. We have certain thoughts and don't have other thoughts and all these things. It's because this or not, however you feel about these things, like people are out there preparing the way for you. And you, if you're going to follow it, you're going to bear the consequences of that. So the step one is to go, oh, wait, wait, wait a minute. <laughs> What's really going on? And I'm responsible. Like we just repeating myself now, but like I have to be responsible for this. I have to know one, one way or the other what's going on, good or bad. Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, it's just, again, if you do one thing, like take responsibility, you can come to slightly different conclusions than me. You can think of it in a different way. You can use a different mental model please take a step back and think about it. <laughs> That's all. You know, that actually leads into one of the chapters of your book that I want to make sure we touch on for the listeners. And okay. It's so important because I've heard this, you know, I've been doing this a long time and I've heard it once, I've heard it a million times. Hey, I don't use the bank. I had to share the story. We were down in a good friend of mine, Mary Jo Herman, her and I went on a road trip last year to the think tank. We stopped in Louisiana. Now from North Dakota to Louisiana over to Birmingham isn't a direct line. It's really kind of out of the way, but yeah. We were talking with a bunch of beet farm, or actually not beet farmers, sugarcane farmers. And the one gentleman comes up to me and he says, he said, what are you doing? So I try to explain it to him. I went through, we helped us take control of the bank function. He says, I don't use the bank. I've never used the bank. We have a cash account, a reserve account that we use. And I said, what's your plan to pay it back? He says, I don't need to pay it back. Cash is king. And if you got cash, you can, you can make your own decisions. I'm like, hey, that's great. Do you love your family more than you love Wells Fargo? I asked him that question. And he, he kind of mumbled and he walked away in disgust almost. Yeah. But the thing I was trying to get across is we hear it all the time, right? Cash is king. Well, I don't use the bank. I just pay cash for everything. But that's like going, you know, if you're going on a journey, that's like you're going to fly from Orlando, Florida to L.A. and you stop in Houston for layover and that's where you stop, right? Right. You're, you're not in Orlando anymore. You're in Houston. But you didn't get to your destination, right? So cash is king. That thought process is it gets you out of the situation you're in, but it doesn't take you to where you need to be. Right, And you wrote right. a chapter on that. Maybe you can expand on that a little bit. Sure. And th this is something that's not in the book. I mean, but again, like I, I talk about this a lot. I think of kind of the truth as a river. Okay. And so in a river, there's all these places that you can end up and you pull your boat off to the side and then you stop there, like you say. And maybe you, you intend to stop there for a rest before you continue on your way. But maybe you don't. Maybe you do stay there and decide, oh, okay, we're just going to set up permanent camp at this particular spot. Right. And I feel like there's a lot of little catches and little ways that people kind of get pulled off to the side and they stop going towards the ultimate truth. And one of those things is to stop at cash. Right. And they just say, oh, OK, I'll just pay cash for everything. And of course, Dave Ramsey, people like that, very much there to, again, receive kind of people that are ready to make that decision and to stop there. But, you know, what is the point that Dave Ramsey and people like that are missing? It's that Ultimately, you have an interest rate with everything that you do, right? You must. Time has a price. <laughs> There's a new book, actually, that I'm about to read, hopefully, as soon as I find time for it, called The Price of Time, and it's about interest rates. That is, that's the missing piece, right? You must have a plan. Okay, okay, if you save cash for something, and then you buy the thing that you save cash for, let's say it's a car. Okay, now how much money do you have? You have no money. You have a car and no money. Right. And then you have to start over. You start at zero again. And then I'm drawing a picture. I know some people are on audio right. here. You save up, it goes to zero. You save up, it goes to zero. Or a hundred dollars or whatever you decide to leave in your, your bank account or what have you. But if you didn't do that, if you factored in the fact that it takes you time to accumulate this, then how does that change your perspective? Maybe you want to have your assets, your capital, your time going into something that respects what you put into it. Bank account does not do that. A bank institution does not do that. The IBC kind of idea, it certainly does that, right? It gives you an interest rate. It gives you a compounding environment. We talked about changing your environment to accumulate wealth. And it gets better every year, right? It gets better as time passes. A bank account doesn't get any better. <laughs> interest rates have been low for years and years. I mean, they're starting to go up, but there's still still a bank account interest rate, right? And you have, I mean, the, the bank is not there to catch you when you make a mistake, right? It's not 
So, they're not going to say, oh, yeah, we, we know you have zero dollars in your account right now, but it's okay. Yeah, you kind of mistake your overdraft, so let's, let's charge you 35 or 40 bucks, whatever the overdraft is. Right? Anytime right. they can make money, you know, catch you, and that's when they'll quote unquote help you. Right? Yeah, kick you when you're down, man. I don't know if I'm really getting to the point you wanted to make, but that's where my brain went. Back exactly to that point is that every, everybody, again, not everybody. There's a lot of people out there that think that, oh, I'm just going to run on cash basis. And to your point, I love your river analogy. If your desire is to, I'm going to start in, start in northern Minnesota, I'm going to float down the Mississippi River, and I want to get to the Gulf of Mexico, right? If that's your ultimate goal, if that's where you want to be, if that's the freedom that you're looking for, the desired outcome you're looking for, then why are you stopping in St. Louis, right? And if people say cash is king, they're stopping in St. Louis, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly, so. exactly. So I love your river analogy. And there's things that pull us off the side. Again, the reason is because because you haven't given the respect to your money that it deserves. Again, you traded your most valuable asset, which is your time, for those dollars. And when you put those dollars to work, you have to treat it with the type of respect it deserves because you did give up that most valuable asset in order to get them. Right, right. We all have an expiration date. It's been said before, yep. right? And so, like, you, you don't just have this unlimited... And people do this all the time and they, I think, have maybe rose tinted glasses on or what have you. But it's, oh, yeah, I make $86,000 a year. And so they just assume that they're going to make $86,000 a year forever. And it's like, what if you lose your job, man? You know, what right. if, <laughs> What if you don't get a, a 3% raise every year? I, my wife and I laugh about the 3% annual raise assumptions that people make all the time. Like, that doesn't necessarily happen. <laughs> right. I mean, it depends on what you do, right? But you, that's not a guarantee. Your job is not guaranteed. You don't know what the future holds. And so it's worth doing a little bit of introspection and thinking like, okay, what if things don't go according to plan? Which they never do. Go ahead. I mean, after 55 years, they never go as planned. Right. Right. (laughs) Yeah. And I'm going to jump around a little bit. Again, I would encourage people, pick up Luke's book. Luke Tatum is my guest today. He wrote the book Between the Lies. So Between the Lies. And where can people get this book, Luke? Sure. Yeah, I actually have a separate website for it. Real easy. So betweenthelies.book.com. And it is, you do have to have the word book. Betweenthelies.com is something else. I don't even remember now what that is. So is it sold on Amazon? Yeah, it's on Amazon. It's actually, the physical copy is printed by Amazon as part of their Kindle Kindle Direct program. And so... It's on audio as well. Then. I'd like to do audio. That's not, it hasn't quite oh. happened yet. I have people ask me every week yeah. to start recording it. And it's like, when I have time, I will. <laughs> but <laughs> haven't quite gotten there. So I'm not sure on the audio. But yeah, there's print and Kindle. And the Kindle is 99 cents. And so it's like, it's practically free information. Just get it. You don't have to call me. Call Wade if you want to get this process started. It, we're not competing with each other like you alluded to before. It's getting the message out there. And you need to find someone. Because we're talking about, when we're talking about a, a advisor-client relationship for this sort of thing, we're talking about a lifetime decision. So, like, if you don't like me, don't call me. <laughs> I don't want to be an inconvenience for you. Call someone that you like and resonate with that shares your values and work with them. And I think that's a key point. I was talking with a gentleman the other day. He's like, oh, my Northwestern mutual agent is trying to sell me this. And my mass mutual agent is trying to sell me this. And I was like, hey, it's not about the product. It's about a relationship that understands your goals and understands the process. And so if you don't want to work with me, I love people that love me. The people that don't love me, I'm going to help them find somebody else. Because right. it's, it's that's the type of business I'm in. I want people that are on my team. And so and I believe everybody that's listening, we would have a great relationship because if you're into this and you understand this we probably have a similar set of values but you have to have a similar set of values right but his point was you know, he's got northwestern mutual he's got somebody else they're all chasing him but they none of them understand the process they always say i can study an infinite banking policy so if you're looking for somebody make sure they understand what the problem is right understanding that you finance everything you do and your wealth has to reside somewhere so why not reside in an institution that you don't want to control that's probably the biggest thing right and then the next you know the next step is what's the process look like if you don't understand the process, I use the analogy all the time. I think I'm a great carpenter I, so because I, I own all the tools. But if you ask me to build your house, it's going to fall down in the first 10-mile-an-hour wind because I'm not a great carpenter, right? <laughs> I own all the tools. Just like any insurance agent, you can sell you a whole life insurance policy, but if they don't know what the heck they're doing, run away because you're going to end up with crap at the end of the day. Yeah. And you're not going to use it. You might, end up with, you might end up with a great product. I'm not. That's not my point. I'm not here to tell you that those agents aren't going to sell you a great product. But if you don't have an idea how a craftsman is going to use that product, then what good is it for you? 
Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with that. I mean, it's I can't tell you how many times anymore I've been contacted by someone that says, you know, I I discovered this idea a while ago. I tried to set up something through my existing guy, like my State Farm agent or what have you. And he said, oh, sure, I'll hook you right up. And I'm not happy with it. He doesn't know what he's talking about or what have you. And so it's like I feel like maybe I didn't do it the right way and I need some help. So, okay, I'm here to help. That goes back to the power of regret. They're regretting that decision because it's something that's important to them. Right. So speaking of that, along that line, you have a couple chapters talking about the power of whole life and the uses of it. Why do you, if somebody says, why do you use that product? Why is that product so important to you? What would you, you know, I've read your book, so share with the listeners why they should pick up their book and understand that chapter. Sure. Yeah. I mean, whole life, like it's a unique instrument. And I think that there's a lot of noise. You mentioned the noise earlier. Of course, we talked about that all think tank too. But the thing with whole life that makes it distinct from everything else is that you have uninterrupted platform for compounding. If I put some money into my whole life policy and but maybe that's not the one thing that makes it distinct, maybe that's one of many, but it's going to compound. It's going to do its thing for the rest of my life. Or if it's a policy on someone else, the rest of that person's life, you know, whoever the insured person is. And you could start these things when someone's six months old. Right. And so that's a long time potentially for a compounding environment to be doing its thing. And it's a powerful tool because when you're tapping into this pool of resources that you've established, that you own, that you control, you're not interrupting that compounding process. You're not pulling it out and then saying, maybe I'll put it back in eventually. It's not really like that. Taking a, a loan on the side is the way I think you should say it. And The insurance company is giving you access to money. The policy itself is just collateral. The policy itself is going to keep doing its thing uninterrupted. As long as you're understanding what you're buying, as long as you're working with the right kind of company, the right kind of advisor, all these things. But that's the idea, right? It's going to continue to do its work day in, day out for you. Every time I log into my accounts to look at my policies, the values are all higher every single day. And and go to my bank account and it's like, hey, I made 12 cents in the last month or 12 cents in the last year, (laughs) depending on the account, right? If you use the the, the savings account, it's not worth more, right? Right. It's worth less. Right. Yeah, you've got inflation's always happening, all these other things. I mean, yeah, and, and depending on where you bank, like fees and all sorts of things like that. It's just, it's totally night and day difference. But yeah, I mean, you alluded to this before. Ownership, control, the things I say all the time, people who know me are going to be sick of hearing this, but flexibility, ownership, control. Say those three things over and over and over. And it's like, how much flexibility, ownership, and control do you have in the bank account that you've got? All right? We talk about the Dodd-Frank Act and the potential for banks to seize your funds right out from under you and all these things. Like There is a lot of downsides that <laughs> they're not necessarily telling you before you sign on the dotted line to open that savings account. And it's just not, it's not a friendly environment for your wealth. It's not going to help you get to a wealthy state either, right? You want something that, that respects you as well. Yeah. And you want it with some, with a mutually owned company, right? That's one of the things that people don't understand. The whole life is issued by mutually owned companies, right? right. Dividend paying whole life is issued by mutually owned companies. And those are the companies that they have no incentive to quote unquote, take their policyholders because if they make a profit, they have to, by law, return that profit or a good portion of that profit back to their policyholders. So unlike Wall Street owned companies, if they have find an edge or they find a, a rule or regulation that they can they can abuse to take their clients to task and earn some extra profit on it, that profit doesn't go, necessarily go back to the policyholders. It goes back to Wall Street. Right. Yeah. Not just a policy owner. And that that's an important enough distinction. You are the owner of the policy. You're the only person who can do anything with that. Or if it's joint right. ownership, maybe it's you and your spouse or what have you. But, you know, the ownership is locked down. You've got it under control. You're the owner. But then also, because it's a mutual, you're the owner or one of the owners of the company that provided it. And so, I mean, are you a part owner of Wells Fargo? No. <laughs> yeah. And, and I think another big distinction, and I don't remember if I saw this in your book, and if I, I did, I missed it. It's like anything else you read and you comprehend only so much. But think about if you own a mutual fund or you have an account at the bank. It is. I, I'm going to pick on a mutual fund. 
That's just an agreement. This is a you have a contract with the company. This is guided by contract law, and that's the most that's the founding principles of this country, right? This right. contract law. And this is a contract, and it lays out the fact that you have access, you have guaranteed access to your line of credit. Where else can you get a guaranteed access to a line of credit, right? You might go, oh, my business, well, my, I can tell you in 08 and, and 2020, Wells Fargo was pulling people's lines of credit yep. without any consultation. They go, boop, it's gone. And so this is a contract, and, it, and nothing else gives you that kind of strength and power you have as with this contract. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, when you read the language, if you actually take the time to read through one of these contracts and, and really realize the implications, of course, that's the great insight that we're all indebted to Nelson Nash for, really and truly understanding what the implications of all these contract provisions are. But, you know, you just sit there and go, oh, they can't tell me no if I want my money, right? Like, <laughs> they, it's not, they can't declare a bank holiday, right? And just say, oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. And they're not leveraged. And that's the other beautiful part about it is that they're not leveraged like banks are. Why did they have to declare a bank holiday in, during, the, during their 30s, right? Because they didn't have any money. Yeah. You go to your bank right now, you might have $2,000 in dollars, and they can refuse to give you that money today. Right. Right. Where they, well, and, and they don't have the money in the bank. That's right. The deposit, and this is this is English common law, and this is very well established if you care to look it up, but your deposit at a bank is not an asset for the bank. It is a liability for the bank because you can walk in and take it back, right? Or you're, you can walk in and ask to get it back. And they, then they have their procedures for whether or not you actually get it or how much you can get today and how much you have to wait for or what have you. But yeah, I mean, fundamentally speaking, on the balance sheet, it's a liability that you have a deposit at the bank. And that's... I mean, that's not really how it should be, <laughs> right? And you think about, like, you look at my policy. The insurance companies actually list policy loans as an asset. Right. They see it as an asset at the bank, right? And so my cash and my ability, if I die, the death benefit, those aren't liabilities because they've already planned for those to have the dollars set aside in order to have that paid. Right, right. Their entire business model is making sure that they can pay those things when... Yep. It's necessary. I mean, and that goes back to mutual ownership, right? Because like it's managed by, owned by people who are also invested in have the same environment, same types of contracts, same. Everyone has a common interest here. And so we talk about a mutual fund and how like, oh, we're just we're mutually coming together to assets to try to make money or what have you. It's an investment company. This is way, way different. Mutually owned life insurance company, like the mutual ownership is to make sure that promises are kept and not just tomorrow. It's not for the next quarterly shareholder meeting. It's like 120 years from now that they're thinking about. And so I don't know. I mean, would you rather be putting your assets in a place where it's all about quarterly earnings reports or would you rather be doing business with someone who's like, hey, we need to think about the 50 75 year time horizons here and make sure that we're going to meet all of our obligations all the time for that entire duration. The question answers itself, right? But you have to be in the right frame of mind, I think, to sort of see that. Yeah, I've used the, I've used the question, you know, do you, would you rather be a customer of the insurance company or the owner of the insurance company, right? And that's the difference between a stock owned life insurance company and a mutual owned life insurance company. Right. right. It's a big deal. Hey, I got more. I appreciate your time. I don't want to abuse it too much, but this has been a fabulous conversation. So again, thank you, Luke. Again, everybody that's listening, Luke Tatum, he wrote the book Between the Lies. That book can be found at betweenthelies.book.com. Did I get that right? Yep. That's it. Um, or you can go on Amazon and find it as well. Yeah. My, my um, main website is perfectspiralcapital.com. That's the name of my company. If anyone wants to read my blog, that sort of thing. But uh, the, book will, the book website will take you there. The book will take you there. It's all, I just say, stop by between the lies book.com and that'll get you where you need to go, whatever you're interested in finding. Yep. And then, so, and we'll have this uh, podcast on, on, on my website, sagewealthstrategy.com as well. So again, the resources there, if you want to get it, I want to hit one more point because it was just so, it was so interesting. I had a conversation with a client this morning and we, and he was talking about, we're just having, he's, a, he's become a good friend. Like most of my clients become yeah. good friends, right? We have. And so we're having this conversation about kids and all this other stuff. And he says, quite frankly, Wade, I have to apologize. I don't pay attention to my life insurance that much. I got all my other investments, all these other things that are taking my attention. And I said, 
And I told him, I said, Bob, I said, that's the purpose. You shouldn't have to spend every day looking at your policy. I said, your life insurance policy is like the best quiet money you can have. I said, what you do for a living with your investments and using the real estate and different stuff. I said, that is very noisy money. It takes a lot of time and attention. But this is doing exactly what we talked about. It is quiet money. You don't need to spend every day looking at it to make a decision. Yeah. And he goes, oh, it's like this light bulb went off. And I've known him for 10 years. So it's just really interesting. He goes, oh, I get that now, right? So it's that idea of what does this do? It's just the, it's the quietest passive income money that you're going to have right in your life because it's going to go up every day and you don't have to make a decision on it every day versus the noisy money that you have to do from your work or for what we do or what our clients do. That's all what we call noisy money. And right. this is, we want people to eventually transition from very loud money, noisy money to as much quiet money as they possibly can get. Right. I, this just gave me a little insight here. We're, I'm always thinking about water, right? Like the river analogy yeah. and all this stuff. I, it's water. It's just my thing. We live right next to a stream that's spring fed. Right. We're homesteaders right here in the middle of the country. And so I, I don't worry about that stream at all, man. It's there. It's doing its thing. I, we have access to water if we need it. Right. That's yep. what it comes down to. Whether or not the the regular like water system is working, like we're on city water or whatever. If you're in a city and you've got city water, like, OK, if the city has a problem, water's contaminated or pipes burst or what have you. Like, that's a lot of problem. But I can always walk right down the hill. And I can go to the stream, right? So it's natural. It's doing its thing. It's, <laughs> I am not worried about that. And so it's just, uh, it's cool to have this like underlying safety, right? And I look at my life insurance every week. My wife and I budget every week. It's cool that it goes up every single time we look at it. But I don't have to look at it for it to go up. <laughs> and there's a big you distinction. Know, I mean, it, you don't have to make a decision on, oh, do I need to buy or sell or right. so how do I make this better? Right. And if you have financial news that you have to read, it right. doesn't matter. <laughs> well, I just encourage people to read Luke's book. I found it again, why I found it fascinating. I found it fascinating, but I found it more as a respectful reader. What I mean by that is you didn't throw a lot of things out there and not have them sourced. You have, you did a great job of sourcing or giving credit to your sources and where that information came from. So it's well researched. So thank you so much for that. And you gave credit and homage back to Nelson Nash, who started you, obviously his book started you down that pathway. Yeah. So again, thank you for that. And because of that, like I said, I found it a great read. It was, it was an easy read. Not that there wasn't a lot in it. It just didn't bore you to death. So thank you for, for <laughs> Thank you. It's high praise. <laughs> so, well, again, Luke, I hope to have you on again soon. Hopefully we will see each other, hopefully future think tanks, or maybe even sooner. Maybe we can... <clears throat> Find a way to get together and uh, see each other before instead of just once a year. Yeah, absolutely. Anytime, just let me know. And it's a pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, thank you, Luke. If you're enjoying this podcast or anyone else that might be interested, please be sure to hit the subscribe button and please leave a review. This will help this podcast reach and help more people by ranking higher in searches and ultimately help more people get out of financial bondage. And don't be afraid to share this podcast with your friends and family. We can be easily found on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. 